What I told her is, honey, the reason that we believe God is true is because he's the best explanation for the way things are. The reason we believe God is real, that Christianity is true, it's the, it's the accurate view of reality, is because it's the best explanation for the way things are. For those who have not heard the story, Greg, uh, you started out as someone who's skeptical of Christianity, maybe even trying to go and disprove Christianity, and then you have now spent 30 years defending Christianity as the correct worldview. Yeah, I, there's some tweaks to that. I actually was raised in a Christian denomination when I became a, um, a high schooler and actually out, out of high school in the mid-60s. Uh, during that whole chaotic time, that's when I said, I don't believe any of this stuff and I left it behind. So I had all kinds of criticisms of Christianity that I voiced just like other people were voicing and still do now. But, but most what I was really interested in was not truth, but doing my own thing. Mm. And so for about six or seven years, I was just out with everybody else. I bought into all the ideas of the culture, and um, I just chased all of those uh, kind of empty dreams, so to speak, and until 1973. Yeah, and I can't even tell you exactly how it happened. It wasn't like I was on personally a, a deep search for truth. But the Holy Spirit just began to work on me, and principally through my younger brother, who'd become a Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, I was the only of five children to go to college and get a degree, and so I thought I was too smart for this stuff, you know. And, uh, but my brother, he was the jock of the family, and I thought, he needs that kind of thing. But I'll tell you what, Mark was really faithful and kept communicating the basic gospel to me in a way that made sense. The Holy Spirit began to work on me until finally I realized I want to become a Christian, and I did. And it was after I became a believer that really I, f I discovered all of the tremendous wealth of evidence and information that we have to help uh, underpin the truth of Christianity. And so uh, pretty much, well, the last 29 years, it's stand to reason, but even for 10 or 15 years before that, I was doing things like this, making the case for Christianity that is actually true. And so the irony is, though I, I thought Christianity was really for stupid people, um, I've spent most of my Christian life making the case that uh, Christianity is worth thinking about and that the smart money is on Jesus of Nazareth. You also talk about how you believe Christianity is the best way of making sense of the yeah, real world. Can yeah. you explain that? Yeah, I, I was having a conversation with my daughter, Annabeth, when she was about eight years old, and she said, Papa, why do we, why do we, why do we believe God is true, is the way she put it. And um, now I gotta answer this question that I answer a lot of times for adults, but now I got my eight-year-old, and I'm thinking about how can I put this? Mm. And all of a sudden this thought occurred to me and I realized this really captured my entire approach to this project of making the case for Christianity. And what I told her is, honey, the reason that we believe God is true is because he's the best explanation for the way things are. The reason we believe God is real, that Christianity is true, it's the, it's the accurate view of reality is because it's the best explanation for the way things are. And, and what I'm getting at there is that we have access to the world and there's all kinds of things that we know about the world, even without the Bible, obviously. And many of these things, I think, are built into us. I talk about this in the tactics book and the inside out tactic. God has built things inside of us that come out that reveal the truth about the world and about Christianity. And we can trade on that. And I talk about how to do that. Um, but when we start asking the fundamental questions, why does it seem that human beings have value above other creatures? Some people are confused on that nowadays, but most people aren't. Um, why does it seem that, the, what, what accounts for the origin of the universe? Pretty much everybody believes that the universe came into existence at some time in the, in the past. What caused that, all right? Um, why are certain things wrong and other things right? And it's not just a matter of personal opinion. Where does morality come from? Well, these are all questions that we always ask because they're real features of the world that we, in a certain sense, bump into. Okay, problem of evil is an example of that. We bump into morality there. It turns out that, as I've explained to my daughter, that the Christian worldview with God making human beings special, God being the standard of morality for the universe, which explains why there could be a 
a problem of, e of evil in the first place. All of these things fit in our worldview really well. So this is what I mean by it's the best explanation for the way things are. It has explanatory power about the most important things that we know about the world even before we open the Bible. Greg, you've been running um, Stand to Reason and a radio show for decades now. Yeah. Are, are, as you look back over all of the interviews and the discussions and the debates that you've had, are there any memorable moments that really stand out to you and say, wow, I, I, I remember this one particular interview where something significant happened that was maybe a, a landmark moment for the ministry or something that just impacted you specifically? Well, there are two, th two, two categories for that. I haven't really thought about that so much, but now I do. There are two categories. One of them is when people call in and they say, I've read the books, I've listened to the podcast I, I've, or the radio show, or you, they've availed themselves of the kinds of material that Stand to Reason provide. And this radically changed my life. Um, in fact, that's the comment that I get most frequently from the tactics book. This changed my life. And that's humbling, but it's deeply gratifying because I like to make an impact. And so I hear that kind of thing a lot. It's feedback. And I am paying it forward in other people's lives. All right. So that's, uh, that's one category. People yeah. say, thanks, I'm, I'm moving forward with it, helping others with it. Uh, second category is when I'm talking to somebody who does not agree with me. Um, like an atheist, and I'll get people that are atheists that call in, and just recently I got raked over the coals by, oh, let me back up and put it this way. Just recently I got critiqued <laughs> uh, by an atheist before his half a million followers, all right? What was interesting about that conversation is um, that he was denying particular things that are part of a Christian worldview. If you're an atheist, all right, then there is no basis for morality, objective morality, absolute morality, if you will, because there's no moral law maker. It's just molecules in motion. Now, for the sake of discussion, that may be the way things are, all right? And therefore, the only thing that we have is our personal opinions that might change over time or might have been created by Darwinian evolution or something like that. But that's all you're left with, okay? And that's his world. That was his view, actually. And he is critiquing me as a theist of uh, promoting objective morality. But in his critique, he kept saying things like, Kokel, you are harming atheists. Well, is harming atheists actually bad? In an atheist worldview. In an atheist worldview, how could it be bad? Now, why is he saying that? No, I don't think I am harming atheists, all right? No. But that he would raise the objection shows that he is actually operating according to the principles of an objectivist morality. There is right and wrong, and Kokel's doing wrong. That's okay? right. <laughs> but that belongs in our worldview. Kokel, you're crossing a moral line right now by what you're doing, yeah. yet there is no moral line drawer in his e worldview. Exactly, exactly. Sometimes when people complain about the God of the Bible, uh, as Richard Dawkins did in his book, The God Delusion, he's got a whole paragraph of adjectives describing this terrible God. But in other writings, Dawkins will say there is no evil, there is no good, there is nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Okay, well, that's his naturalism talking there. Where is he getting the standard to judge the God of the Bible by then if he's an atheist? My point is he can't do otherwise because he's still, even though he's an atheist, he's still a human being made in the image of God. And there are things that are built into him, like morality, that are gonna come out even when it contradicts his worldview. So some of the precious moments that I've had on the, on the air is when, when he, atheists, in a certain sense, speak the truth of the Christian worldview while they're trying to refute it. That's precious. And I have an opportunity to try to exploit that mistake uh, in my conversations with them. How do you help people communicate the Christian message of the gospel in a generation that seems to be moving further and further away from the idea of absolute truth? Yeah. Well, th th there's a shell game going on here, Kirk. It's a very important question. And the shell game is people do not believe in absolute or objective truth when it suits them. But when it doesn't suit them to promote relativism, 
Then they become objectivists, just like the case of the atheists I was talking about, okay? People like to have their own set of rules and their own ideas about truth, my truth, your truth, whatever. But when somebody else's truth interferes with their truth, then they raise objections. Okay, and so what's it going to appeal to, to some sort of an objective standard that cancels them? We're, we're back into the same circumstance that I was talking about earlier. I think the reason that people um, are so into this now is because you have a massive cultural forces that are encouraging it. Okay, yeah. this mistake goes back to the garden. Okay, in the garden it was I don't want God, I don't want His rules. I want to see what I like to see, what looks that it's good for tasting, it looks good. I mean, all this is in the garden. All the subjectivistic things, so I'm gonna satisfy my own desires. Well, now that's been institutionalized in every outlet of media just about in the entire country. It's the same fallen nature, Kirk, that is self-centered, but now it's, it's been, as I said, institutionalized. Think of the slogan of this age, you do you, you do you. So I think what's happened isn't so much that people have really gotten away from finding truth, because we're looking for truth all the time, and we believe in objective truth. In fact, if we couldn't know the truth about the world in certain important ways, we'd be dead in a day. So we're always doing that, looking for truth. We deny truth when it's inconvenient for us, mm. and especially when it satisfies our personal de desires. You do you. Then, you know, all bets are off. I'm the center stage. But that's not new. That goes back to the garden. Genesis chapter three. You were talking about the opportunities that we have when someone contradicts their own worldview to exploit that mistake. Right. How do you do that in a polite way? Okay, I have found a life-changing way to do that. When I say life-changing, over the last 15 or 20 years, this has absolutely transformed the way I engage people. And what I do is I use questions. Now, I pause there because it's um, that doesn't sound very profound, but it's amazing how effective it can be if we get into the habit of it. We can use questions to gather more information. People make claims against Christianity, okay? Um, well, then I wanna say, well, help me understand that. What do you mean by that? Bring, the Bible's been changed over the years. Well, explain that process to me. How did that happen? Tell it to me. And the, I want them to tell me more about their objection. Okay, now this sounds counterproductive maybe yeah. for many Christians. Like, I don't wanna hear more of the objection. But I found that when people speak more about the objection, they end up realizing that maybe their objection isn't as powerful as they thought. Mm. Another thing that I wanna do is if a person is making their point against Christianity, the impulse of a lot of Christians, especially more aggressive ones who've had some training in Christian defenses, is to give the reasons why they're wrong. But we see, what we've done then is we've taken the responsibility, uh, the burden of proof, on ourselves. And if another person makes a claim against Christianity, there is no God, or the Bible's been changed, or Jesus never existed, or we evolved, et cetera, et cetera, um, it is their job to defend their claim before it's my job to refute it. So I'm going to ask another question. Okay, I understand your view, because I've drawn them out a little bit with the first question, what do you mean by that? Now I wanna know, how is it that they came to that conclusion? Tell me a little bit about the reasons why you think that's so. Now again, I'm not advancing my view yet, so how am I making progress? Kirk, people will be absolutely stunned by using two questions, what do you mean by that, and drawing people out to get more information, and asking for the reasons for their conclusions in different ways you can ask that, you'd be stunned at how much progress they're going to make. Mm. Because lots of times people don't have good reasons for their right. views, and when they or any at all. And sometimes when they are asked to articulate it, they don't know where to go. Okay, I call it the uh, Simon and Garfunkel moment because these are the guys who wrote the song back in 1966, I'm dating myself, called The Sounds of Silence. And that's what you get in a moment like that. So um, those are like two steps where there's no pressure on the Christian at all. And what the Christian is doing is gathering two different types of information in the conversation. Mm, right. so, so if you were the one who opposed me in a particular view, I'd want to get as much information from you as I could, Kirk, on what your opposition was and why you think your opposition is legitimate. 
okay? Notice I'm, I'm, I'm not in the deep end of the pool here. I'm right. ankle deep. I'm not taking any pressure because I'm not making any claims yet, okay? The third step is very similar, but it's, a, it's an advanced step. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, ask questions to make a point. So let's go back to our atheist that we were talking about who's critiquing God, the God of the Bible, as immoral. All right. Now, I know, and I explained this point earlier, that the atheist in his worldview has no sufficient grounding or foundation to make a moral charge against God. Because if it's just molecules in motion, there's no morality. And as you like to say, uh, he's got his feet firmly planted in midair. That's right. Exactly morally. right. Exactly. And so I could just say, um, you can't claim, claim God is evil because there's no grounding for evil in your world. You don't believe in good and bad and evil, and etc in your worldview. But see, I'd just be arguing with him. Instead, I can make the same point by asking a question. And in that case, I'd say, tell me, where are you getting your moral standard that you're judging God by? Now the ball's in his court. I've asked a question. It's his job to answer. But the question goes right to the weakness of the view. Now, of course, you need to see the weakness. Okay, and I do talk about that a lot in the tactics book, and I, um, I'm actually writing another book to follow up on the tactics uh, franchise, so to speak, uh, that gives more information about that kind of thing to help people to ask the questions to exploit the weaknesses. But um, notice, though, that these are all questions. Notice that I can be completely relaxed. I can have a conversation with somebody in a relaxed manner. I'm not banging heads with them. I'm not mad at them. I'm not getting into fights. I'm, I mean, I'm very passively defending my turf by asking questions about the other person's view. Yeah. So this is the tactical approach that has changed everything for me. And it's why so many people who have read the book, Tactics, A Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions, have said to me, this book has changed my life. Greg, the Bible talks a lot about discernment, and we need to have it. Right. Uh, can you explain what, what is discernment and why is it so important? Well, discernment is when you look at a circumstance and you try to figure out what the truth is regarding that. Okay. Now, when the Bible talks about discernment, generally it's talking about spiritual truth. In fact, uh, Jesus mentions to the, the Jews, he said, you can kind of discern the signs of the weather but you can't discern the signs of the times. Yeah. You don't get what's going on here uh, in, a, in terms of the flow of ideas and spiritual truth, okay? Now, I mentioned earlier that there are two different ways that we know truth. One of them is through our natural faculties and other things we have to be told. And in God's, God's case, God has to tell us most of the things that are important. And so this takes us back to scripture, all right? so common sense notion from a Christian. How do you discern truth? You use scripture. But using scripture is not, not always that easy because characteristically, Christians have bad habits when they go to the text. So let me point out something in 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is the verse in verse 16 where it says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, etc. Okay? Notice the word scripture is the Greek word graphe. That means the writings. All the writings are inspired. In other words, it's not the ideas that we're thinking of when we're reading the writings. It's not the stuff we find between the lines, so to speak. It's not the, what we're getting out of the spiritual ether while we're reading scripture. It's the words themselves that communicate the truth. This is why we are to attend in scripture to the words in relationship to each other in paragraphs. I have a principle that we have at Standard Reason, we've said it many, many times, and we use it because it's so effective. And the principle is never read a Bible verse, okay? Huh? Yeah, like what? throw the whole thing out? No, what it means is you, if you wanna know what a verse means, you can't just read a verse, you have to read at least a paragraph or more you know, to get the meaning. Mm. If somebody tuned into the show and heard one line from our discussion, they'd have no idea what we were talking about. They'd likely get it wrong. But if they're listening to the discussion, then they're going to see the context of the remarks and, and it's less likely that they're going to misunderstand what we're talking about. Well, we got problems in the church because we got different views on a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, whether we're talking about uh, the work of the spirit today or we're talking about end times or we're talking about heaven and hell, we're talking all kinds of things. You give us 
in, in your Stand to Reason ministry, uh, a, a few ways of detecting discerning truth, authority, correspondence, and intelligent design. Can you, can you just explain okay. those three to us? Well, sure. Um, a lot of non-Christians don't like it when Christians refer to the Bible. Oh, you're just using that as some kind of authority. You know, that's not an authority claim. But the fact is, when you think about it, most of the things that we think we know and probably do know, we didn't learn from personal experience. We got it from somebody else. I know water boils at 212, but I never went down to sea level and got my butane lighter and uh, boiled water to find out the temp. Somebody else told me that. In fact, almost everything that we know about places we've never been, we learn by authority. So the question of learning by authority is not odd. It's a standard way. The real question is, can we trust the authority that we're citing regarding the issues. And this is why I think Jesus is so magnificent because he said all these things that were controversial, yet um, why should we believe him? Well, I think a lot of what he says makes common sense. But beyond that, he rose from the dead in history. Now, any guy that can get, get himself killed, be in a grave for three days, uh, be mummified basically, 75 pounds of herbs and spices packed in his body and Three days later, pop out of the grave as the Lord of glory. Okay, that guy's got credibility with yes, me. He's got some cred. Yeah, he's got some cred. Exactly, exactly. So authority is a, is a real important aspect. Coherence is something else, too. Um, if you have a system that is true, a way of looking at the world that is true, a worldview, okay, then there ought to be coherence in that system. That means it ought to fit together without contradiction. By the way, this is one of the reasons why non-Christians will raise the problem of evil against Christian theism. Because they say, you have a contradiction in your worldview. You say God is good and he's powerful. And uh, therefore, if that were the case, it wouldn't be evil, but there is evil in the world. So what do you make of that? Yeah. It's an attempt to show that our view is false by an internal contradiction. And then what about intelligent design? Well, <clears throat> this is a faculty that we have um, to determine whether something was made for a purpose or whether it just happened by accident. Um, uh, if you, if it's called the design uh, intuition, if you will. And if you, if you look at a little um, origami pterodactyl, that's so tough to make. But somebody would look at this, and here's what a kid would say. A kid would see, see that, and they'd say, how did you do that? Right. Show me how to do that. Because they intuitively understand that that is the kind of thing that requires know-how to make. But it, it, some people just seem to deny that. So they'll say the origami th thing needed to be made by someone, but then they'll look at a real swan and say that didn't need to be made by anybody. Now that defies common sense. Final question. You talked about wanting to make sure that the authorities that we cite in our positions on whatever the issue is need to be credible. And we want to cite the Bible as our ultimate authority. Well, God is the ultimate authority who wrote the right. Bible. How can we help people rely on the Bible as a credible source of truth? Well, I have a talk um, on, uh, on the scripture that I've been given for years and years. It gives you six reasons why we can trust that the Bible is a book not by men about God, but a book principally by God through men and to men, but the author is God, not humans. Principal author, okay? But when I got to think, and it's a good talk, but when I got to think about it, I believe the Bible's inspired by God. I think it's inerrant. But I believe that before I put my talk together. In fact, the people that I give these reasons to in churches already believe the Bible's inspired, all right? Um, and the people who Listen to Jesus, for example. Jesus didn't give them all these reasons why he speaks for God. He just spoke. And I realized the reason that most Christians properly understand that the Bible is God's book is because they engaged the book just like those who listened to Jesus engaged Jesus. And the soldiers initially that were sent to arrest him came back empty-handed. They say, where's Jesus? And he said, no man spoke as this man has spoken. And, and I think there's this, it's hard to explain this, but, but when we read the text, there's a ring of truth to it, okay? And um, this is true, forget it, Bible aside, this is true by a lot of things. We read these things and say, well, that makes sense to me. They're made by, written by humans, but it makes sense to me. I think this is the way, the most powerful way people are convinced 
that the Bible is God's word because they actually engage it. Yeah, I can give fulfilled prophecy, unity of scripture. I, I can talk about um, how scripture describes the big picture in a clear way. I can talk about archaeology and how all those other things life. and how the, the experiential thing. Yeah, uh, we can talk about all of those things are important. And they're, they are objective evidences for the truth of Scripture. But in fact, most of the people who believe the Bible is inspired aren't thinking about that. What they have is an encounter with Christ through the words of Scripture. It's nice to have these other things so that we're not simply trusting in an experience. This is where LDS folk are. You know, they just got an experience, our Mormon friends. You know, they got a burning in the bosom, but they believe something very different than we, so we can't both be right, all right? When it comes to our scripture, though, we have a testimony to the entire Bible as we're reading it. It's self-attesting in a certain sense, and we also have objective evidence that the Bible is what it claims to be from God to men, not by men about God. And those two things working together are really powerful.